Good morning. Welcome to class again together. We're, today we're going to start uh, three classes on the Gospel of Luke. We've gone through Matthew and seen some of his unique uh, characteristics of his Gospel, and we've done the same with Mark. Luke presents a whole lot of things, most of which had to be culled out because there's just too many of them to deal with. But some of the important ones I think we're going to try to hit in this. Today we're going to talk about Luke and some of the unique parables that are found in his gospel. But as we get started, I want to ask you this simple question. What is the best story you have ever heard? Now that may be difficult for you to, to think about. I, I guess I remember one, the first time I really got hooked on things like this. There was a preacher whose name was Fred Craddock, and Fred, uh, because he had a thin voice and he was not tall of stature or a he developed the technique of being able to tell a good story. One of his stories was about a, a young man who was teaching uh, in uh, UCLA, in fact. He was an American Indian. He's a Native American. One of the things that he said in a story form was, one morning, his mother got him out of bed early. It was still cold outside. There was snow on the ground. And she bundled him up in a blanket and took him to a little hut outside of town on the reservation. It was a Hogan where his grandmother lived. She was a Kiowa Indian, and he had descended from the Kiowa Indian tribe. He told a story about that day, about how she told the story of great buffalo herds, of the hunts, of the wars between both the Native Americans and the white settlers. At the end of the day, his mother picked him up as the sun was going down. And what he said was, I went into that Hogan as a boy. I came out a Kiowa. For some reason, that story has stuck with me all these many years. A story of great identity. So which is your best story? I'm sure you have one. It would be interesting to, to know. We could sit around and swap stories all day long. But let me ask you this next question. How does a story help you listen? Now, when I start to tell you a story, what do you normally do? Most people lean forward. They start getting caught up in the, in the details. They start finding out what's going to happen next or who this is or how this relates or all those pieces. There is a reason why movies move us more than speeches. But great speeches are nothing more than extended stories. So it is interesting that when you go all the way back in time to the time of Jesus, as Luke writes about him, Luke decides to say, let's tell you a story. And he lets the stories of Jesus come through. But he has stories that none of the other Gospels have. Now, all Gospels, all the Synoptic Gospels share some, some parables, frankly. They share, for instance, the parable of the sower. It's, all, it's in every one of them. Matthew has it, Mark has it, Luke has it. And it's essentially the same, which is an interesting thing by itself. But when you come to Luke, Luke's parables are the ones that you remember. We're going to talk about some today, but let me just, as the beginning, just mention their names and see if you don't flesh out the story without even looking at it. The Good Samaritan. The Prodigal Son. The Rich Man and Lazarus. The Pharisee and the tax collector in the temple praying. Every one of those stories, plus a myriad, myriad of others, are found only in Luke's Gospel. It's interesting what they teach us, what they're trying to convey, and how they affect us today. And that's what we're going to look at today. But for first, as we're entering Luke, I, I feel like we need to have just a peg in the ground and say, this is what this gospel is about. This is a few introductory details. I know in lesson one, we talked about more of this. 
here I just want to bring up a few things again. First of all, I think Luke is the first volume of a two-volume set that we call Luke and Acts. What's interesting about Luke and Acts is they are, they are roughly the same length in terms of numbers of words and numbers of chapters, roughly the same length. And when the scholars have studied that length, what they understood was that each one would fit on its own individual scroll and no more. A scroll had a, had a physical boundary that if you tried to get it too much longer, it would begin to get brittle and break and tear in places. And so it was limited in the number of sheaths that could be put on a scroll. And it appears that both Luke and Acts fit on one of those. And so when Luke writes, he writes a gospel, but he's not writing just a gospel. He's writing something else along with it, which is the history of the growth of Christianity through Jesus Christ. In fact, if this was a different kind of class, I could show you connective tissues that would show that very clearly. But there's just one that we want to talk about. First of all, when you read Acts, Acts chapter 16, you come across an interesting passage. This is a passage about Paul taking his second missionary journey, and he goes to places like Philippi. We know the story of Paul going to Philippi. He is in prison. He meets Lydia. He, uh, as, when he's in prison, the prison has this earthquake. Uh, the jailer sees this, the inmates are going to escape. And, but Paul stops him from killing himself, and he wants to be saved. He wants to be baptized into Christ. And that very night, he is, he and his family. We know that story well, but I, that's not the point. I want you to pay attention to the pronouns in this story in Acts chapter 16. Immediately after Paul had seen the vision the vision of a man of Macedonia saying, come over and help us. Immediately, we, listen to that, we sought out to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia, and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside of the gate to the riverside where there was supposed to be a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together. One of us, one who heard us, was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul and after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us, and we were going to the place of prayer. We met a slave girl who had the spirit of divination and brought much to her owners by way of gain, by fortune telling. Now, I emphasize those pronouns we and us for a reason. It appears from the writings of, of, of Acts that Luke is an eyewitness to the events that happened in the formation of the church. One of the things he witnessed that becomes very apparent in through some of the things we're going to talk about today is he saw the conflict of Jewish Christians being resistant to welcoming Gentile converts to Christianity. The big debate was, before a Gentile could become a Christian, did he have to be circumcised as a Jew to become a Christian? That was the pitched battle of the first century. It is what the whole ministry of Paul was about going to the world, not just to a tribe. And so it is that Luke brings a unique perspective to the life and teaching of Jesus because of this problem. Everybody 
feels when they write. There is a there is something in in their in their background. There's something that's going on in them that allows them to pick and choose and say this needs to be part of this because it's something that has a burning responsibility to them. And so because of that, Luke looks at all the things that Jesus has said and done, and he is as selective as Matthew was or as Mark was. He too selects. One of the things he likes to select is parables. Now a little bit of word about parables. Parables are an interesting form. They are hard to write. The word means to cast alongside. And a parable for all practical purposes takes a concept and casts it alongside life so that you can see the concept in life. But the way it's put together is a marvel. The way Jesus put them together was even more marvelous. When Jesus spoke parables, he gave you enough detail to see the scene, to feel the, the tension, but he never gave you so much that he took away something that your mind had to figure out on its own. For instance, the story of the prodigal son, we're going to look at it this morning. What's the name of the father? Or the older son? The younger son? What kind of house did they live in? When the boy went to the far country, where was it? All of those things Jesus doesn't tell you, but you fill in in your, in your mind. Let me give you an example though, of that, just so you'll be aware of how, how this concept works. Listen to this sentence. Mary told me Joe is getting out tonight. The old gang is going to give him a party at Marty's. Now, let me ask you these questions. Who is Mary? Girlfriend, sister, or wife? And where has Joe been? Has he been in the army and he's getting out? Has he been in the hospital and he's being released? Has he been in prison and he's being paroled? And what is Marty's? Is it a friend's house? A bar? Or a restaurant? All I had to say was, Mary told me Joe is getting out tonight. The old gang is going to give him a party at Marty's. And you filled in a lot of the blanks about who Mary was, about where Joe had been, and what Marty's was all about. From your own experience, you made this story yours that way. That is the magic of parable. So as Jesus speaks these parables that Luke has, I want you to think about that. What's going on in your own mind as you listen to them? The first we're not going to read because it's, there are three that are so familiar. In Luke chapter 15, there are these three parables, this triad. They all have the same theme. Something is lost and is found. One is the parable of a sheep. A shepherd has 99 sheep. One strays, and so he leaves the 99, and he goes and gets the, the one and brings it back. The lost have been found. The second story is about a woman who has... Ten coins, probably a set. That's the best we can figure out that what makes it that valuable. One of them is lost, meaning the set's worthless. And so she sweeps their house until she finds that one. And she calls all of her friends and says, That which was lost is now found. Then there's that third one, the longest one. About a father who had two sons. The oldest boy was very diligent. A dutiful older son firstborn. The younger son, though, decided he wanted to strike out his own, so he demanded his inheritance, which his father gave him. He goes into a distant country where he wastes it on riotous living. He finds himself in the muck of a pigsty, and he realizes that in his father's house, there's a lot better than this, and so he was going to go make himself a servant, and the father comes, and he runs to meet him. He puts his arms around him. He puts the robe on his shoulders, the ring on his finger, gives him a, a great banquet, which all signifies forgiveness and that all is, for, all is forgotten. 
And the older son comes in from a hard day of working and he sees what's going on and he's upset and angry. He sits on the stoop and he pouts. His father comes out and says, why don't you come in? And he says, I've been working for you all these years and this is what you get. This profligate son of yours come home and you give him everything? He said, son, you're very dear to me. But that which was lost is found. That which is dead is alive. Let me ask you questions about those stories. How do they strike you? How do you think the shepherd, how do you feel about the shepherd who forsakes the 99 for the one? Is that prudent? Why is one coin that is lost so valuable when you still have nine? Well, the last one is very important. Which character do you sympathize with? Which one are you irritated by? What surprises you about what the father did or did not do? Was he being fair to his oldest son? Was he being helpful to the younger son? Now, we're going to return to this in a moment. But I guarantee you, all of us, including me, get an impression of what is being said to us in that story. But let's go on. We're going to go to Luke chapter 18, eight verses. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow that, of that city that kept coming to him saying, Give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he refused. But afterwards he said to himself, Though I fear neither God nor respect man, yet because of this widow keeps bothering me, I'll give her justice so that she will not... Bear, uh, beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, who will give them justice speedily? Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? How does that parable strike you? Is Jesus trying to tell you and I that we need to badger God because He is so resistant to what He wants, to, what we want? Is the way we get what we want? It's just to be a, a, a badgering, persistent person. Is God like the judge or unlike the judge? How is He similar? How is He different? How does Jesus use that story? to convey an idea. And how does it fit with verse 8? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? How does it answer that question or help advance it? Now I guarantee you, as I told that story, as we read the story together out of Luke, you saw a face of a, of a woman and a face of a judge. You felt what the judge was feeling and what the woman was feeling. How does that feel to you? But let's move on. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. A story we call the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told him a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this very night your soul is required of you. 
the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, how does that grab you? This farmer, isn't he just being a good businessman? Is that not what good businessmen do? How are you like him and how are you different? How should you apply that to your life? Should you not care about riches at all? Should you not care about money at all? Should you just go out to the desert, become a hermit, give away everything you have, and just enjoy life in the presence of God? Is that what God and Jesus is trying to say? See, all those things are embedded in these, these, those, that parable. And as you read it, you hear various pieces come out in your own life, things you need to hear. And one more. Luke chapter 16, 19 to 31. The story of the rich man of Lazarus. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and feasted sumptuously every day, and at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dog came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in, his ma in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that you, he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, no, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, They do not hear Moses and the prophets. Neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And that story does it get under your skin? I'd like to point out one thing. This is the only parable that Jesus ever tells that has somebody who is named, and that's Lazarus. And what's fascinating here, the rich man has no name. He is anonymous. Lazarus has a name. Why do you suppose Jesus names Lazarus and leaves the rich man anonymous? What does it convey? Is this a story about retribution? Role reversal? Is this really a parable or is this an actual event? That's been debated for centuries, by the way. Is the rich man compassionate for wanting his brothers to be told or fearful? Where are you in this story? Now, the question I want to ask us this morning is, why does Luke have these stories in his gospel when no one else does? I don't know the full answer to that, but let me give you some observations I think I've made through the years about this. 
It is through story that people discover the truth without being told. Do you like to be told something? You know, most of us, we are fairly resistant to various things. I want you to think for just a moment how this would have been different had Jesus done this instead of telling the parable of the prodigal son. He turns to the religious leaders, to the Jewish leaders, and says, you should be happier that I'm going to the to tax collectors and sinners and trying to get them saved. You should be happy about that. If you were one of them, how would you react to that? Or why doesn't Jesus just tell the crowd, stop worrying about your money so much. It's not worth it. Rather than saying, I want to tell you about a rich man and his barns. Or, you know, you folks need to start treating people better, especially the people on the street that are poor and impoverished and you're just walking over them every day and not even paying attention to them. You need to pay more attention to them. There was a rich man and his, his gate lay a beggar named Lazarus. Which are you going to listen to? See, the one that you, you listen, you get sucked into that story and at the end all of a sudden you go, uh-oh, I feel this. I don't know why. I don't like this feeling, but I feel it anyway. And because of that, through the use of parable, Jesus and Luke can poke the bear without being mauled. You know, it's really hard. If, if, the, if the Pharisees, in, for instance, in the, in the prodigal son story, had said to Jesus, Do you mean us? Jesus could have said, do you feel guilty? Now, how are you going to handle that? No, I don't feel guilty, but I still think you're talking about us. What makes you think that? They don't want to answer that question. Now, there's one story we didn't get to today, which is the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan story, Jesus asks that question, who proves to be neighbor? And he reluctantly gives the right answer. But he started with the idea, what, am I a good boy because I love my neighbor as myself? See, at the end, you don't want to admit that you haven't been doing that. I always find that an interesting thing. Years ago at Waterview, uh, Vicki and I decided we would shift our seat for a few Sundays into a whole different area. Now, I have to tell you, at, at, at Waterview, the, there are four different congregations depending on where you sit. I know I sat in all of them, and all of them are different. They all have different personalities. They all blend together. They have It's like a family that have four kids. They, they're all different, but they all sit at the table together. But I remember Vicki and I went over to the other side of the auditorium, sat in an area we didn't ever sit at, and I remember during the, the greeting time, somebody came up to me, and they said, did they send you over here to spy on us? And I looked at him and quietly paused and said, should they have? Now, there's a way to end a conversation. If somebody makes an accusation, you used to ask the question, what are they going to do next? That was a convenient way for, for Luke to get his point across to people who would be resistant in any other way. He could poke at them, and they could feel uncomfortable with not accusing anybody of something. But the other is, the stories relayed that Luke relates contain what I call layers of application. Years ago, I was studying with a, a very intelligent fellow. He was a computer programmer. He had grown up in a home without even having a Bible. He didn't know a thing about the Bible. I had married him and his wife, and so I was studying with, with him. I ended up baptizing him. It took a long time because we had to start way back here. 
far away from where we usually start and bring him all the way up. But I remember I used a, a term once, and he was fascinated by it. You know, he was one of these guys, he, he was very intellectual. And so every once in a while, I will use a very intellectual term with intellectuals. The term I used was polyvalence. And I was talking about the polyvalence of Scripture. Now, that may not mean anything to you, but it, has, it fits right here. Polyvalence means different kinds of coloring, different kind of layers. If you want to see it, all you got to do is look at the parables of Jesus. For instance, the parable of the prodigal son. Is it a story about a dysfunctional family and their issues? A father with two boys who are so different they can't seem to get along. Do you not know families like that? Or is it a story about the Pharisees and the sinners and how they looked it down on down their noses at those who are who are coming to Jesus? And how wrong that was, because they were the good faithful folks. Was it about the Jewish Christians and the Gentile converts? As they sat there and said, unless they keep the law of Moses, they can't be part of our church. And if you baptize them, we're not going to welcome them. Or is it about church members and non-church members? Somebody comes in and sits down, the first thing we do is what? I wonder why they're here. I wonder if they're dangerous. We should probably not talk to them. They're that kind of people. You say, we don't do that. Yeah, we do. But see, do that, does that not apply? Does, does that story not apply to all of those places? Modern life, ancient life, first century church, 21st century church? It applies all the way. When Luke writes these stories, when he puts these stories in his gospel, when he takes what Jesus has taught and puts this in there and as the way he taught them, he is giving something that is so evergreen you can't ignore it. And it applies to all of us. But he is writing to a Greek audience who is hearing, who is hearing this gospel and he wants to sharpen a point. We're going to come to this again next week. He wants to sharpen the point about who God accepts into the kingdom. That is a huge issue. Now we say, well, we've solved that. I don't know that we have or not. But in the first century, they, they sure hadn't, and they had apostles with them. In Acts chapter 15, verse 5, for instance, there is a, a succinct statement that Luke writes of what the big controversy of the church was then. But some of the believers who belonged to the party, the Pharisees, rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. They're talking about the Gentile converts that Paul has made on his first missionary journey, and he comes back and he reports all his glorious success, and they're sitting there going, mm, not in this church. Does God accept them or not? Or are they going to have to go back and become circumcised and become Jewish, and then only then does their baptism match anything? Does it fit then? But let me ask you, based upon the parables we looked at today, and through what I know about people and my experience with the church, does God accept only the rich? Do we not have a proclivity for the rich? Someone comes and places membership at church and they are a vice president of whatever. It makes no difference. And they are quite wealthy. And they drive up in a Mercedes Benz. And they're wearing a Brooks Brothers suit. Do we not treat them differently than the guy that comes in and hadn't had a bath in three days? Or when early in my ministry, there's something that didn't sit well with me. I had an elder. We were it's a small church. We had 50, 60 members. We couldn't make the budget save our life. I remember 
this family came and visited one Sunday. And one of the elders came up to me and said, you need to go see them this week. They've got a lot of money and they could really help us. Something about that still irritates me to this day. Because it has this undercurrent statement that God accepts the rich better than he does the poor. Does he? Does God accept only the Pharisees? Those people who are morally good, morally pure, and does he exclude everybody else who's not? Suppose you come and you convert someone who has come out of a really rough life. I've done that before, by the way. And the hardest thing to do is get the church to accept them because they are still rough. Their language is not so good. It slips from time to time. They try to hold it back, but the words come anyway. They're coarse. They don't know anything. When they talk about things that you go, you don't tell things like that in church. But they don't know any better yet. Is that the does God only accept those who have got their moral act cleaned up, but not those who haven't yet? It's a question for us that these parables ask. But when we listen to the stories that Luke includes, what do they teach us? Maybe by way of conclusion of this lesson, just some things to wrap this together. There's so much to be said, but we don't have all that time. So let me pull together four observations I made for myself. And you can either say yes or no, or uh, agree or disagree. First of all, these are the bedrock values of Christian experience, from what I can tell. My opinion, perhaps, but I think it's probably accurate. Number one, the lost are valuable to God. They must be both saved and welcomed. We talk about wanting the lost, but when the lost, the real lost, are won, we're kind of jaundiced at times. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where they're really, I don't know if they're really converted yet or not. After all, they don't act like it. Did you when you were first converted? You see, the, the problem is we see, we don't, we see the lost as a group of people out there who somebody needs to take care of as long as it doesn't mess me up. Jesus didn't come along, didn't mind coming along and messing up the system by bringing tax collectors and sinners. And it's messy when you do that. And, but it's also godly when you do that. Where Jesus, even in the story about Zacchaeus and Luke, came to seek and save that which is lost. Secondly, Wealth vanishes, so don't depend on it for your life. When you're young, you tend to start thinking in dreams of grandeur. One of these days, I'm going to live in this kind of house. I'm going to drive this kind of car. I'm going to have this position. I'm not going to have to think about money anymore. And I have known young couples who have bought houses that they could not furnish with furniture because all, all of their money was going to that dream house. But you know, there comes a point when you turn a calendar page and you start asking yourself a different set of questions. It's not about how much is in the bank, but how much do I have left? Don't believe me? Let me ask you this question. We're approaching the Christmas season. Just from what you know about you, your family, and other people in your age group, how many Christmases do you have left? You see, that question is more important than what does my bank account say right now. It's a bedrock value. Your life does not consist in the abundance of your possessions. 
Third, a rich man without compassion ignores more than just people. He ignores God and His will. Overlooking people is also overlooking God. It's a very strong statement in Scripture. That when you look at the poor, you're looking at the face of Jesus in some way. Do you help them? Do you th what do you think about them? It's awfully hard. It's hard for me. But are we more like the rich man as he steps over Lazarus in his gate every day? And are we not stepping over God at the same time? And will we persist when it seems to be fruitless? Christian life is hard at times. It doesn't seem to pay off. We like things to pay off. We, we're struck more with the question that's behind the book of Job. Why do the righteous suffer when the wicked prosper? There are some people that come to a point that says, it's not worth this anymore. There's that question at the end of the parable. When the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith on earth? It's a question he asked you and he asked me. So what's your answer? Thank you for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to be with you and I hope you have enjoyed this lesson as much as I have. Next week we're going to come back with a lesson about Jesus and the outsiders because Luke has a real interesting take on people outside of the, current, of the, the accepted communities. So thank you again for being with me. Have a great day.